good morning, afternoon or evening, and welcome to the Hazy Night. Why are we here? What a deep question, dear. Why are any of us here, really? You know what I mean. Well, I'm here because you didn't manage to spoil the surprise for Sir Askadaf. Is that how you thank me for saving your boy knight's life? And speaking of me, I'm pretty sure I just saw... What were you expecting? A warm welcome and a toast in your name? Hmm. I'm sure there are a lot of ways to greet someone that don't involve trying to get them killed. Not for you, there aren't. Oh, honey, come on. <laughs> Is that really the tone you want to start this conversation on after disappearing for three days? I was just hoping you'd have forgotten by now. Anyway, stop stalling the conversation. How did you know where to find us? Let's just leave it at Dioff and I had an axe to grind, shall we? So he was playing both ends? She knows Dioff too? Sip made a discreet choking motion towards Adder. Know him? <laughs> my, I would certainly hope so. He was the only horn eater my age around the desert rose. Oh. <laughs> the evenings we spent roasting fools to death. Hold up. You saying you two are the the same age? Are you ready to gamble your life on your next words, dear? You look younger. Oh, flatterer. If you two are done with this stupid farce, I'm still waiting for an answer. Why would you take me back? No, I know that much. Why bring Adder along? Is this really all Geoff's doing? Is that so surprising? Even a squandered waste of a man like him can't help wanting what's best for his little sister. And her boyfriend. Before Sep had a chance to contest any of those statements, Miss Rochelle scurried off towards one of the guards. Oh, oh, help, please! Sir Askadaf needs reinforcements. Some miserable ruffian has knocked him unconscious in the middle of Forlorn Avenue! The squad standing in the way immediately marched away. Rochelle merely watched them leave. After this, she waltzed around the corner and headed for the servant's back door. See you on the other side. The door was left ajar, only adding to Sepp's confusion. We're not actually going in, are we? It's clearly a trap. Sepp, I've been trying to tell you. I think I saw a beast tailing us. You think? I mean, I know a whole darn lot of fluffy folk with glowing eyes and interesting body shapes could be a number of things. That was a fair enough point, much to Sepp's chagrin. She sighed into her hands, considering their options. If I have to choose between beasts, I suppose I'd rather deal with the one I know best. Don't worry, Sepp. I'll be right there with you. That's the part that worries me. The back door into the desert rose closed loudly behind them. Though they truly feared the worst, Raoul didn't suddenly leap towards them with an army of guards and ropes. She didn't seem to pay any heed to them at all, busy as she was washing her hands in the ceramic basin by the entrance. When she finally turned around, the apprehension that the lovers radiated made her grin. I have to admit, I didn't think you had the metal to come in. We're in trouble, Ral. Far worse trouble than you or Elbar. Oh, trust me, I know. It's written all over your face. I hadn't seen you this scared since that time you ran into the door and snapped your little horns in two. Oh, you cried like the world was crumbling around you. Nothing we can't fix this time either, I'm sure. Feel free to slip out of that fancy new dress of yours into something more comfortable. I'll ask the servants to bring some tea. I'm not leaving Adder alone with you. Then I guess you'll get to wear matching clothes for a little longer. How fun! Miss Rochelle swaggered off into the kitchen to request a few things. After that, she ushered her guests to the exquisitely decorated meeting room nearby, where anything from raises to the deepest secrets in the palace were always discussed. 
Raoul reached out for a clipboard lying on the rock glass table and started taking notes. Honestly, she couldn't have looked more unbothered by their presence as she went about scribbling down notes if she tried. It occurred to Adder, one of the rare strokes of genius he had every once in a while, that such stillness of face and mind had to be the product of years of effort. All manners of defense built up in answer to the certainty that her secrets could be stolen at a glance. This observant thought vanished into the nether as one of the servants arrived with a kettle, a small tower of pastries, and only two glasses. Adder had spent moons having licentious dreams about this re-encounter with the love of his life, the almond pastries slathered in fig jam, honey, and topped with a date that he had so unwillingly abandoned. He was well past the point of taking any hints. What's the big idea, Raoul? Well, if you must know, I'm trying to figure out our bleak night schedule. I'm thinking about shifting some of the performances around on the 2nd 4th next moon. See? I have a feeling one of the usuals is going to be grounded for a long, long time. Well, if I win... You may, you may not. not. Seb and Rochelle locked eyes, surprised at their simultaneous intervention. Adder limited himself to shrinking back into his seat, certain that he didn't want to arouse the anger of either woman. Raoul, I need you to listen to me like you haven't ever listened. It's the only thing I'm going to ask you in my whole life. Ooh, a favor and a lie right after getting saved from a romantic escapade. This should be good. Rochelle pulled the kettle towards her and started pouring herself some tea. Zeb took this as her cue to start. I know that what I'm about to say may seem impossible to believe, but... Heirloom will be attacked soon. By beasts, no less. They're not just a fantasy, Raoul. We've seen them ourselves. If what they said is true, they're planning to carry out some sort of moral population call on the deer. I don't know how long we have or who's going to be affected by it, but they'll wreak havoc on the city if we don't do anything to stop them. Miss Rochelle remained very still for a moment. The only sight of life in her was the subtle quiver of the hand holding the kettle which had topped the ornate drinking glass quite a while ago. Dang my melt, sugar. That's horrifying. Do you believe me, then? Of course I do. I know you wouldn't lie about something this silly. If you say beasts are coming to eat us all, then they most definitely are. Oh, bless the gods. You have to help us, then. You're the only person left in the city with enough power to stop them. I'm honored you think so highly of me, but I don't have the power to do anything about this. I couldn't even stop you from frolicking around with this mismatched fawn and ruining your future with Sir Askadaf. None of that matters now. Besides, I'm sure that Elbar is jumping in joy at the chance of rescuing a swooning princess from a pirate or whatever. We'll be fine. Honey, please. You weren't so naive as to think that little stunt of yours will be enough to mend your relationship with a knight, are you? You're dead to him now. You made sure to thoroughly soil both of your reputations in front of the whole city yesterday. Th that's not what happened at the trial. So that's what it was. <laughs> See, a doe like me tends to ponder why there's a whole puncheon of wine instead of a gazelle at her doorstep. One thing leads to another, and then what do you know? I got to see my favorite girl slapping Lord Burbeth of Askadath. It's funny how news flies when you're barely yards away from them. Miss Rochelle took a long sip from her glass. Her eyes peered over the edge, gauging Seb's reaction. A wry smile accentuated her point as she continued. We're so fortunate that our princess never needed to learn from her mistakes. How odd, 
Adder couldn't help but feel like he had heard such an accusation before. Little did that matter now. Zeb was staring intently at Rochelle with eyes wide open. Glowing. Who told you? <laughs> Just sis! There you go doing funny voices again. Don't waste your tricks on me, dear. I was going to tell you anyway. The flame behind Zeb's eyes disappeared, but she didn't relax her stance one bit. I knew we'd have to have this talk sooner or later. Kids grow up so fast. I guess... No. Yes? Mm, perhaps you are finally old enough to hear the truth about your mother. Say what? You really think someone as smart as Sip's gonna fall for such an obvious... Sip snapped at her snout shut. Oh, my poor Thar. With a guy always spending his nights down the street and three children to mind, your mother needed a confidant. Someone who could fill her loneliness when that dead weight wasn't around reminding her of the vows they'd made. What are you getting at, Rel? Come on, dear. You know what I'm saying. Won't you read my mind? Would you rather I spell it out for you? Rochelle placed the empty tea glass back on the table. Sar was my wife, as far as either of us was concerned. Not his. You and... Mom? When? Why? What? Adder needn't have been a gaze reader to guess that Zep was mentally going over every time she'd seen her mother and Rochelle sleeping away together in the past. Are you sure that you want me to fill you in on all the details? Zep gripped the edges of her skirt her face burning with more emotions than she had words for. But didn't you used to say you were you off sage? Don't you ever dare ask me that again, dear. All that matters in the end is that her two sons looked and sounded too much like him. It was hard for her to even talk to them, to make excuses for a guy day after day, to have a constant reminder of all the poor decisions locking her in the pillory of his life. But it was different with you. You were her own reckless choice. Her daughter to the very end. Her precious little curse. Rochelle leaned back into her seat, drinking in Sepp's stupefied reaction. Yes, she told me everything about your circumstances from the beginning, darling. That's how I know those half-made tattoos on your boy night aren't precisely a fashion statement. So that means... It means that come next week, Elbar will have forgotten all about you and you can simply start your tale anew as many times as you need. How exciting. Hold on one second. Hold on, because I can't believe what I'm hearing. You knew about the curse, and yet... You kept her locked away from me and everyone else in the world all this time? Of course not. She chose to shut herself in, just like she chose to let herself out. And I'd say she's learned to open up quite a lot since then. And you just casually let her do anything she wanted as long as it lined up with what you wanted her to do. You think you're fooling anyone here? You, you heartless tunk. Well, that's uncalled for. I let Yassif leave and she came back of her own accord. After you broke her heart, may I add. You do remember that, correct? I only had to welcome her back and watch her cry over some worthless misshapen fawn like I knew she would. I didn't even have to ask. It was obvious like that. Adder opened his mouth to retort, but the right excuses failed to take shape. Don't think I don't sympathize, dear. Offering your unconditional love to someone like her takes a thick hide. <laughs> Much thicker than someone like you could ever have. I will give credit where credit is due, however. You've really gone above and beyond to come back and break her heart one last time. I'm never gonna hurt her again. No, you're not. 
These words were sinister enough to throw Adder back out of his rage. They were emphasized by the familiar sound of a mechanical whir approaching somewhere behind the wall. You really should have run away when you had the chance. Zeb only snapped out of her own shock when the door swung open, revealing a finely dressed merchant, followed by a retinue of marble deer, four of them to be precise. Tasakir Mat Septuit. I apologize for failing to visit sooner. Taylor! Gyof told me how to. No, honey, Joff isn't that heartless. For what it's worth, he had no clue that we had a guest. Indeed. I'm afraid I had to keep my presence unannounced. This may very well be the first time I've fallen ill in ten years, as far as anyone in the guild is concerned. I've been anxiously anticipating my sister's return since the news of the trial reached my ears yesterday. I see I wasn't wrong to worry. Taylor, whatever it is you've heard, I can assure you that there are more urgent issues to take care of right now. I'm afraid I have postponed this matter long enough. Rest assured that everything I do, I do for your own safety. With a snap of his fingers, a golem crept behind Seb and apprehended her, gripping her arms back and away from each other. Golem, hold her gently but firmly. She's branded a second deer. We don't know what else she may be capable of. You don't have to do this, Taylor. I... I... Ral, please. I'm serious about the beasts. There's no time for this now. We can't possibly fight them. We should evacuate the palace and run as far as we can. Run, she says. <laughs> Dear. This is why you'll never be a businesswoman. You let your feelings get the best of you every time. You aren't thinking about this rationally! On the contrary, I'd like to think that I'm being quite pragmatic. Anyone with a purse is more than welcome in the city. And seeing how convinced you are of this, Taylor and I are going to find out how much coin the beasts carry very, very soon. We're all going to- With a single nod of Taylor's head, the golem shoved a sleeve against her mouth. Come on, honey. Don't look at me like that. I'm sure you knew this was a trap. Whatever you were hoping to achieve, you miscalculated the risk. Ral smiled almost proudly. Ah, the flame of youth. Who knows? Maybe the beast will eat us both and you'll get another chance to pry this place off my dead cold hands. For now, however, I think you need to spend a good long while in your room thinking about what you've done. <gasps> Adder! Adder, run! Don't even try to... Zeb's muffled screams vanished in the distance as the golem carried her upstairs. Thalid didn't bother turning his face towards Rochelle before speaking. Keep Septuit safe and out of the way. Make sure she doesn't hurt herself trying to escape. And for the love of everything, Ral, get her some decent clothes. Rachel pressed her lips into something that could only barely pass as a smile as she closed the door. And yet, right before it was fully shut, she peeked in one last time. Do me a favor, dear. I know it doesn't make much of a difference at this point. But that twerp truly made sure to treasure Yasif as much as he could. Don't drag this out too much. Taylor nodded curtly as the door was locked behind him. The moneylender finally had the decency to look someone in the face, just in time to observe Adder circling a table defensively. Before I remove the last hint of asymmetry from that crooked face of yours, there is something I would truly like to know. What name shall I write on your epitaph? Adder should son of your father the upper field. If you gotta write something pretty. <laughs> How unsuitable. I would have much preferred a real name. Be it as it may, I must extend my gratitude to you nonetheless, Adder. You have far exceeded my expectations. Oh, yeah? 
You don't say. I had long wanted to emasculate that miserable excuse for a captain of the guard in public. Alas, no matter how long my reach is, noble blood always remains one step beyond. Untouchable for those of us who have everything in common except their veins. I am thankful to you for stealing my sister away from that useless waste of nepotic breath. I truly am. But not thankful enough to forgive my life, are you? <laughs> no. I will simply finish what that oaf started. With just a half nod, two of the golems switched into an alert stance. The third got closer to tail it. They lowered their body painfully slowly, causing their knee joints to emit a high-pitched hiss that made Adder flinch. Next he knew, they were dashing at an impossible speed towards him. Thinking fast but not straight, Adder grabbed the kettle and hurled it towards the closest golem. The brass projectile bounced away miserably, and the scalding liquid did nothing to deter the machine. Adder kicked the table up just in time to watch a fist go clean through the glass. Undeterred, he gripped the metal frame harder and swung it towards the second golem, hoping to catch both of their hands in one swoop. He found himself lifted off the ground instead, paddling in the air for his life. Moving with unnatural coordination, the golems spun their whole arms in a wide arc that sent both Adder and the table flying against the wall. He heaved as the metal frame and the heavy rock crystal table's tabletop slammed against his body, though thankfully it didn't shatter. In a battle of strength he was clearly heavily outmatched. The golems hurtled towards him once more, but Adder had something they didn't have, a ridiculously nimble body. Adder flicked the frame as one of the golems lifted the table, distracting them with a tinkling sound just long enough to roll under their legs and leap towards the door. He tugged on the handle with all his strength, only to remember it was locked. Yeah, I was going to say, wasn't the door locked? Are you looking for the key? Adder turned his face towards Taylid. A white blur struck right where his snout had been just a moment earlier. He saw the arm pass by his face in slow motion, dodged by fractions of an inch, only to land instead inside the mahogany door. Well, I mean, I guess he doesn't need a key anymore. The door's history. <laughs> the golem rattled its arm, trying to dislodge it from the wood. It finally resolved to swivel its torso around like a spinning top, ripping out a sizable chunk of wood that stuck to him like a shield. Careful ladder. That could have been your skull just now. Well, at least now he has an opening to escape through. The hole it left behind was bedecked with splinters, a few bristles of yellow fur, and half of the bolted lock. A wild idea started, started to take form inside Adder's mind. No way! My skull's way thicker than anything these guys could ever break. We'll have to see about that. Adder ducked a surprise right hook from the second golem, only to find himself suddenly splayed against the wall by a shield charge from the first one. His face was left completely exposed to a potentially lethal jab, leaving him with less than a precious second to tilt his neck. 60 impressive degrees to the right, leaving the golem trapped against the wall. Down from the ground, emboldened by his successful strategy, Adder spun jump 
up to send a powerful left upper hook towards the golem's mask. Oh, Spun jumped. Okay. His fist stopped flat against the marble. A narrow crack sprouted up across the artificial face. Adder was rewarded with a broken knuckle for his efforts. Ouch. Ah! Yeah, exactly. The poor boy screamed as he gripped his left hand, cursing and stamping his foot down while the golem futilely tried to remove its hand from the hole it had punched on the brick and concrete wall. The shielded golem crept up on him from his blind side, punching him right in the pit of the stomach. Ouch. Adder's body sank down against the wall. Two more terrifying blows succeeded this first one. And just like that, they stopped, giving him just enough space to fruitlessly attempt to limp away. This ain't nothing, Adder lied to himself as he spat some blood over the carpet. The golem that just landed a hit was approaching him. Another remained next to Tailed. The last one continued to struggle to release his arm from the wall. Adder hadn't taken ten steps when one of the golems grabbed him by the back of his neck, showcasing its quarry for Tailed to admire. Sate my curiosity, Adder. How did you plan for this to end? Though the boy wasn't particularly predisposed to reply, focused as he was on keeping down the pastries he'd just eaten, the answer most definitely didn't include a, fa a fractured rib or two. He tried to throw a rather miserable punch in the moneylender's direction, only for it to get dodged with supreme ease. You surely didn't think someone like you could emerge victorious. You didn't presume you could merely elope with my sister and get yourself named a knight for your efforts? Something tingled inside Adder's sash as he swayed at the golem's mercy. You are a shrub, a mere beggar. You will never be good enough for Sep or Aina or that pathetic leech Geoff. Adder reached for his purse. So how dare you fancy yourself too good for me! Adder extended a weary, open fist full of tinkling metal towards Taylor. I'm so sorry, Mr. Taylor. Would you accept this as payment for all the trouble I caused? Taylor crossed his eyes down just in time to see two metal rivets sticking out of Adder's fist get shoved right into his nostrils. The golems jittered as Taylor screamed and cursed, clutching his snout. With a well-placed kick to the golem's torso, Adder propelled himself out and away from the automaton's grasp. Still wielding a rivet in each hand, Adder ran back towards the wrecked door and started punching away at the wood, trying to carve a hole that would let him reach the latch. Uh, Adder sinned! The golem started stirring behind him. With a force pulled right out of memories of muscles he no longer had, Adder threw his good arm back and tore the door from its hinges. He spun in place and bashed it against the first of the pursuing golems, splintering all over its head and slammed it to the ground. Adder lurched out of the room, holding his side in place the best he could, while the second golem futilely tried to leave the room with a chunk of wood still stuck to its hand. I really don't know why you insist on having him send all that wine. It's not even good. 
There are much better drinks out there if you just want to batter your liver. Far removed from all the commotion, Miss Rochelle ambled through the corridors of the first floor, a few steps ahead of the golem that held Sep prisoner. You don't even care, do you? You just want it because you can get your hands on it. Whether you like it or not is besides the point. Sep had stopped struggling a while ago. She merely sagged in the golem's arms, her sight firmly set away from Rochelle. This was somehow a greater offense to the older woman. What is it? What are you thinking in that magic brain box of yours? You think that I'm part of this? You think that I wanted any of this to happen? That I somehow plotted the death of that poor hick? I gave you the choice to go through with your stupid elopement and let me forget all about you. But no, you came back with your tail between your legs to drag us all down with you, as you always do. And of course, it's now up to me to fix everything as usual. To say, yes, Mr. Taylor, no, Mr. Taylor, so he won't lift a finger against us for letting things get this far. Like we had a say in all your whims. I used to think you'd thank me when you were older, but the years keep coming and you never seem old enough. <sighs> I really thought I raised you smarter than this, Sep. Their stroll finally came to an end once they reached Sep's door. Slowly, methodically even, Rachel counted each and every key in her keyring, pretending she didn't know the shape of this lock by heart. It's not fair if you can't even defend yourself, is it? The golem bore its empty, empty gaze into Rochelle as she tugged its sleeve away from Sep's mouth. Raise me? <coughs> Raise me? How, how warped can you get inside your own lies? You want a medal for doing the bare minimum to drag my weight through the mud just because you loved my mother? This is all your fault. Can't you see? Ah, so it's my fault for trying to keep you alive. That's nice. With a light pat on its back, the golem started marching again into Sepp's room. Rochelle pulled her key up again. All you've ever wanted was to bleed me dry. You never trusted me with my own decisions. You never even cared once about what I needed. I want to see you well, and I want to see you flourish, and I want to keep you from throwing your life away at every turn! You're the one who keeps forcing me to be the villain in your story. What part of that is so hard to understand? How do you manage to make everything about you? If you really care, stop playing the victim for one minute and just listen to me, okay? You never had to do any of it. I didn't ask you to. So you've tried to keep me well? Well, you failed. I'm a mess. You're the whole reason I keep trying to throw my life away. Because guess what? I never wanted any of this. Neither did I. Not very far from the argument now, Adder leaped the steps in two, running upstairs using rivets as climbing aids in a desperate bid for his life. Just a hair's width behind him, more than, a, more than well acquainted with the tip of his tail already, two golems chased him relentlessly. Why are you doing this? You don't gotta listen to him! We're all in danger! Ah, uh -huh. negotiating with machines, are we? <sighs> Save your breath. They cannot hear you, and they do not need a why either. They will kill you because I ordered them to. No mercy, no emotions. Still halfway along the stairs, seemingly recomposed despite the nosebleed on full display, Taylor casually strolled up. Adder flung a flower vase downstairs, trying to buy some time as he scanned the third floor in search of a strategy. They'll only come for me? That is correct. A golem is so advanced that they will not harm any other living. Not one second after Taylor had finished saying other, 
others started knocking on the first door he saw. He kept on banging on every door he staggered past, on the walls and on the woodwork over the windows, yelling all the while. There's monsters in the desert, Rose! Run! A group of very confused performers and servants started trickling into the corridors. At the sight of the rampaging golems and the blood on Taylor's face, the tide grew and roared with terrified screams, surging towards the nearest exits. The automatons swiveled their torsos in short, brisk bursts, trying to find their target amongst the skittering denizens of the palace, to no avail. Adder, in spite of his worrying state, had somehow managed to seemingly vanish. Is this your master plan, Addersend? Playing hide and seek until the beasts arrive? Never one to fear getting his hands dirty, Thalid sidled calmly past the throng, glancing over each door that lay ajar in his wake. Nothing. No trace of Addersend. Are you truly going to waste my time so brazenly? Increasingly desperate, Thalid started looking over the rafters, inside the vases. Any shape a lanky yellow stack could have somehow contorted into to slip past him. He leaned over the railing looking over the patio, hoping to find Adder hiding behind the colonnade, over the roof, anywhere. Come out and face me, you cowardly horn eater! Who are you calling a coward? <laughs> it was during one of these brief instants where Taylor's attention lay so easily misplaced that Adder suddenly cast himself up from the ledge behind the money lender. You're the one who's hiding behind two golems, you hypercontract! The weak stag used what little strength remained in him to hurl his whole body upwards as he swung his head forward, managing to bash the pitiful stumps on his head against Taylor's bare forehead. The moneylenders uh, stumbled back, there dazed by his second blow. But Adder wasn't nearly done yet. Taylor didn't even get a second to scream in pain this time. With a giant hand firmly wrapped around his neck, Taylor suddenly found himself weightless, floating in the air. Right over the thin railing stopping the escaping crowds from falling over onto the patio. Feeling the call of their master, the golems rushed towards them, but there was very little they could do in such a difficult situation. Very little that wouldn't end with other dropping their master three stories down, and therefore breaking their orders, that is. Call him off, Mr. Taylor. We ain't got time for this. <sighs> You're a lout, Addersind. You may think yourself bold after fooling my sister into thinking your life has any worth, but let me assure you once more, there is no outcome where you win. Even if you were to kill me, my golems would still carry out my last command. You'd be dead before I reached the ground. <coughs> Assuming you could ever have it in you to see through this pitiful intimidation attempt. Keep assuming, man. I've seen more people die than you could have ever killed. <laughs> what an odd choice of phrasing for a threat. Do you know what those words tell me? They tell me you have never killed. You may have caused deaths, perhaps, but you're still so afraid of combination that you think they make us the same. <laughs> There's a world of difference between killing and letting people die. Tell that to Lord Dumar when you see him! Adder needn't do more than swing his arm, and suddenly Taylor's body was launched up beyond the railing, away from any salvation. 
There was no reaction on the golem's part, no time to think. The moneylender's mouth hung open in disbelief as he felt his weight flying up towards the clouds for a brief instant, before suddenly precipitating down, reclaimed by Dakna. A life lived in fractions of a second, memories of so many decisions. Not even the tailed could remain so cold as to make space for revenge inside his mind as he fell. His descent came to an abrupt end, but not his life. Taylor's neck whipped forward violently as he was suddenly jerked back up by the collar of his tunic. A single piece of fabric stood between the red deer and certain death. A stag leaning over the railing to stop his fate. Without another word, Adder Holt tailed back over the railings and tossed him on the ground. Tailed could only stare at him, awestruck, confused. It soon morphed into something more familiar, superiority. <sighs> you didn't have it in you. No, I 1000% do. I got it in me, alright. I know I do. I want to look at you and I just know I do. The world would be so much better without a weak, hoarding scum like you taking advantage of everyone else. When I think of that, I could drop you a thousand times over. I could choke the life out of you right now. But you're Seth's brother, and she loves you. And I know she's... She's for real convinced she's got to be like you too if she's going to get anywhere in this life. Y'all could be right. Oh, you've definitely been way better at me at this whole surviving thing. But I still think it's wrong. I know it's selfish, but I... I don't know how I'd look her in the face ever again if I gave you a taste of your own medicine. I don't want it to hurt more than I already done. So maybe you're right. Maybe I don't got it in me to be like you. Not yet, I don't. Is that so... That's very stupid of you. Kill him. There were no magnificent movements, no great strategies, no tricks. One of the golems simply tackled Adder, splintering the railing like mere toothpicks. Adder and the machine plummeted down in onto the patio several stories below. Sep ran out of breath for a moment, an unnatural chill crawling up her spine. Her ears shot up. Something was wrong. But this ominous premonition had nothing on the side of her shell furiously slamming the door to Sep's room open and shoving the golem out. You want me to treat you like an adult? Fine! Let's all quit pretending then. I may not know what strange magic you cast upon my wife, but I know sure as I'm standing right in front of you that you ain't no Yasif, no queen, no princess, no nothing, honey buns. You're just some ungrateful cursed brat that I can't seem to get rid of. Still, you want to be called a different title every single day? Just say the word, sugar. I'll call you any and everything you want. Because know what, your grace? You ain't never even had a name to begin with. So what? Mom found me in a palace in Basaksarat. She said it didn't matter who I was. I would become Jasif. Oh, yes. She found you in a fortress, I bet. But it was in the kitchen of some third-class castle wherever in the northeast of memory still serves. That makes you what? The Mary Queen of an Inn in Tosal, maybe? Cal can't, if you're so desperate to get some sun. What are you talking about? Honey, your mother told me all about the day she rescued you from some poor maid who was just overwhelmed minding her other children. Yup. She just had to become obsessed with this one runt. The most special indeed. That's a lie. You're lying. You want to blame someone for all this? Blame Thaw for losing her mind. Blame me for caring at all. But it's about time you got this into your head, you home-wrecking perisher. If it wasn't for you, she'd still be alive! 
N no. You know all the well I do that a guy wasn't here the night she died. No. No, that's not... What did you do? I, I didn't... It wasn't... What did you do? Adder was certainly a resistant boy. His skull seemed made of the strongest cement. His bones were steel beams. But even the sturdiest house crumbles to pieces when slammed against the ground with the force of a stampede. Adder blinked once and again, trying to see past the dark haze in his vision and the weight in his chest. He could see a caricature, a face of sorts. The boy had never dared look at a golem up close, much less so in the light of the day. He was afraid of what he might find, of testing his convictions. But now, there it was, right in front of him, about to kill him. He was all out of excuses, and he could see it crystal clear. The golem's eyes were all wrong. There was nothing inside of it. In the same way one can tell apart the warmth of a heated metal and the warmth of a body, Adder could see that these creatures that looked and felt so much like Aina had nothing to do with her. He reached out and wrapped his less broken hand around the golem's mask, still cracked from the punch that had wrecked his other hand. Adder didn't hesitate this time. The mask crumbled into pieces inside his fist. Only metal and clothes remained. <laughs> I knew she wasn't, no. Dark, again. He heard something metallic falling nearby, two sets of steps, then silence. <coughs> Adder gasped in pain as Taylor staggered through a thin trail of blood where it rested on his neck. You put up quite a fight, but it's over, Adder. Taylor lifted the dagger in the air ready to bear it down full force on Adder's chest. Adder followed the movement of the dagger as it rose through a half-shut eye, until a little flame sprouted in a corner of his sight instead. Taylor's dagger pierced skin and bone, and it would have punctured Adder's very heart, if a sudden blast of scalding air hadn't pushed Taylor off him. What? Fire. Fire coming out of the other side of the palace, towards the sky, all over the roof. Fire coming from one room. Step! No! Taylor ran in the direction of the fire, muttering desperate things under his breath. Adder just lay on the ground, bleeding, with his eye closed. He heard one set of steps move towards him, then another, and one last. As he felt the golem's weight climbing on top of him once more, he couldn't help but think it was almost funny, really. His second time getting stabbed wasn't quite so bad as the first but he couldn't seem to find the strength to get up and run this time around. Is this how you die after all, Bones? Struggling to keep his eye open, Adder looked up. He saw the point of the knife, the golem's arm, and the silhouette of another hand stretched over him. That's so sad. I thought I'd get to kill you myself. His eye rolled back towards the patio, finding instead the royal pathway hovering over him. He heard a young guard screaming and the Joseph losing her will to escape. It sucks, doesn't it? 
and it's only going to get worse from here. He felt the ground falling under him, bereft of the power he had when he jumped down with Sep in his arms. <sighs> he ran through a wall, and he climbed up a window, and he made his way into someone else's mind. He did so many things he could have never done on his own, because someone else was there, watching him. If you're not going to fight, I'll order Aina to let that thing put you out of your misery now. <coughs> and he wondered if that was magic too, if she had been looking after him before he even knew, if she had just wished him well while he couldn't do anything for her, if he was just glad to feel useful again. Get up. He tried to breathe, tried to follow the lessons she had so insistently taught him, though he knew why they never worked, why he could never look inward. No, not like this. Get up. Memory after memory started filling his mind, memories he had so gladly given away. That's it. Fight. He saw his home and the cart taking him so far away. The last time he would ever see his mother and his father and his siblings. We need you here a little longer. He saw his boss and the fort and the captains new and old. He remembered the last time he slept with two eyes. The last time he let himself rest and give up. Get. The last time he failed everyone. Ah! He wouldn't fail again. Good talk. I'll catch you later, pup. Sorry, I just wanted to check if you were still paying attention. I am! I so am! How could I not be? I finally know where this is going! It's the day without sun! I learned about this back when I went to school! You aren't going anymore? Uh, no I have special permission to miss out on it! Oh, the curse of my precocious intellect! I was too smart for my teachers. They couldn't handle my genius. <laughs> I feel like I may have perhaps started to develop an ear for Lynn's lies. But not yet the heart to call her out on them. Lynn, are you sure you want to continue with this now? It's really late. And I'm rather concerned, er, uh, nervous about your health. Well, aren't you a fretter? I'm not fretting. I'm just letting you know you could die at any moment. Lynn blinks once, in such a way I can almost hear it. She squints her eyes at me, just to double check. That's one hay of a fortune. It's not a prediction, it's a fact. You will die. Uh, yeah, uh, won't we all? No. Lynn finally seems to understand. Whatever it is, I need her to understand, I suppose. There's still a few hours left before sunrise and you're... You're not really in a rush to go back, right? Would you care for a nap? Would that put you at ease? I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm so at ease right now. Never been more unbothered. Lynn makes no effort to hide the fact that she's looking down on me. Fine, I'll take that nap! But 
kids, let it be clear that it's for your sake, not mine. And not because I'm a kid. Of course. Lin continues to grumble as she folds her arms into a headrest. Rest well, little one. Moments pass in silence. I would not be able to guess how long. My mind keeps screaming at me to run. Nothing good ever comes from involving myself with mortals. But she's just a child, and it is a fact that kids are phenom phenomenal. The greatest bloodling invention. Their minds are quick and sharp and so full of hope. No, they barely even need hope, more like. They just see things as they are. The world is kind in their minds. I never got to be a child, and I'm not a gaze reader, so that's just my impression of them, I suppose. I can't help but admire their commitment to positivity. She'll be fine. She has a whole life ahead of her. But... I may as well get some work done while I can. Let's see if I remember how to do this. To the worshipful Constable Buntalos, greetings. I seek thy mercy in this hour of... No. Dearest Adarga, it is my great hope that you are still exuberant and thriving. I have need of your... Hmm. Listen here, you vapid offshoot of a decomposing turnip. I need a favor. I nod to myself, content with my great progress in the field of writing an introductory letter, and proceed to reach out for another sheet. This one's already been mysteriously smeared full of ink. As I draw the new sheet back, I realize... I've gotten a hold of the sketches Lynn was doodling. Her smug kid face sits turned on her cheek at the other end of the table, pushing the page towards, towards me. Did I do Sep's foot justice? I remember it a little bigger. I'm starting to think you like to exaggerate her assets. You just weren't there to see it, Lynn. I'm sure you can tell me all about the greatness of my ancestors. Weren't you going to take a nap or something? Yeah, I was. Lynn's half-closed eyes glide back to the drawing. Her insolence remains unreadable. You know, one of the first lessons you learn as a gaze reader is that nobody is really coherent. People can believe two opposite things at the same time. Our thoughts don't need to make sense. Most people can't really tell why they do the things they do until somebody else tells them. And that other person is just guessing. Why are you telling me this? Because I know that you want to leave. And I know that when you leave, you'll be gone. I've seen that from the start. And I won't ever find out the actual why, because not even you know why you'll do it. Lynn. I don't want you to go digging for excuses now. I just wish you wouldn't try to convince me that you're doing it for my sake. I do worry about... It occurs to me that perhaps that is the problem. That I still cannot say these things I so need to say. Or that after so long I'm no longer required to. And that my thoughts are hardly my own from the moment I met her. So the question remains a direct one. Maybe, or maybe not. We could spend all day coming up with theories, really. I understand that people don't always have a reason to want to leave everything behind and start anew. Did you have one? 
A brief twitch breaks Lin's current stroke, leaving an ugly blotch of ink in an otherwise pristine page. There's a dramatic lack of sound around her as she stares at it. I... I can't believe this! You truly are a dismal narrator! Stories are meant to be told one at a time! That's right. I'm sorry. Good thing I have such an eager writer here to fix all my shortcomings. Indeed! How fortunate you are that I am here, and that I am rested and ready to finish this story. That makes two of us. The end. Yes, we shall reach an end tonight, if we hurry. No time to lose then! Chapter 5 The City Without Us Or, what better way to end a story than when things have already gone south? Darkness A net cast over the sky, pricked by the stars who refused to be hidden. What a curious phenomenon, darkness. Where the midday sun had sat in its throne above the city of Heirloom just moments earlier. For the first time in decades, the curtains were drawn over the celestial stage of Dakna in its totality, so that its overawed inhabitants may gaze upon the stars in the middle of the day. A day without sun. But history demands we lead our eyes away from the wonders of the sky so that we may witness the horrors of the ground instead. The story of our protagonist starts and ends with a corpse. And I am almost certain that it was a corpse. Not a breath left in his lungs. Not a beat left in his heart. Still, it moved. Magic or pure instinct? To this day I still don't know, but after a scream the likes of which the world had never heard, the streams of blood running from his open chest trickled down into a drip. With this surge of strength, the dead man ran, past the deactivated golems, past the fleeing denizens of the desert rose, into the fire that had spread all over the first floor already. Septus! Open up! Sep! They lead banged helplessly on the door, rushing against the flames trying to make their way out of the room. His last two mechanical companions lay discarded against the wall, having been reduced to eerie porcelain carcasses after the blast. Seeing him on his knees, defeated the way he was, you would think that Taylor hadn't noticed the fire encroaching all over the first floor. But what else could he do but scream? Who else could he turn to? The gods? Without his personal retinue, Taylor was turned again to nothing but a weak runt. The deer who could barely gather enough strength to push down a handle. All the money in the world would not make the door budge. Sep! A presence crept up behind the treasurer, casting a large shadow over the door he was so desperately pulling against. Daylight gasped at the grim apparition. It only stared back. In the dark void left between the flames engulfing the corridor, Otter's eye shone an unnatural blue. How? The question sank back into his throat the moment a massive hand fell on his shoulder. But the gesture betrayed no grudge. Taylor was gently pushed out of the way. One short shove and the door flew open, 
Tendrils of fire and smoke grasped at them, but Talid still ran in first. Sep, answer me! There was no Sep in that room, no answers and no sign of life. There was, a, was dark smoke and char. There was fire roaring over them, devouring the curtains and the woodwork. And in a, cur in a corner, curled on what remained of a bed, a charred silhouette caught against the envelope of flames. No, not flames exactly. The moneylender could only recognize the creature in front of him by the blue embers that once formed her eyes. Pumpkin. Talid extended a hesitant hand towards the licks of fire. They seemed to lash at him, making him scream in pain as he recoiled. As if beckoned by a sound beyond Talid's senses, the dead man behind him started lumbering forward. Don't you dare touch my- The ease with which Adder's form grabbed Talid by the neck and tossed him through the window would have surely been a surprise to both. The red deer flew across the room and into the balcony, nearly toppling the woodwork as well. It was the mercy of the lattice that spared him from death this time, not Adder's. Once more, he could do nothing but watch as Adder gently kneeled down and destroyed his sister's life. The silhouette of a ruminant was no more. What Adder lifted into his hands may, may as well have been a heap of ash with bells. The embers around what remained of Sep crawled over Adder's body, gently kissing over every cut and bruise, giving life back to him as they faded away. One last speck of light buried itself in the wound in Adder's heart, glowed one last time and disappeared. So followed the eerie glow in Adder's eye vanished in a calm blink. Uh, what? There only remained in the room a confused boy, a lifeless body, and a fire threatening to kill them all. No, I lie. There was Talid too, much too shocked to pay any mind to Adder's newly sprouted fear of him. He lifted himself off the ground, dusted himself and took a handkerchief to his nose to wipe away some of the blood. Follow me. Adder didn't have time to think, much less hesitate. He followed suit. Through empty corridors and burning debris, Talit walked in front of Adder, leading him with determination. His fame of having ice-cold blood didn't betray him. What? What happened? Where'd the cuts go? I thought I was bound to... Cease your useless yapping! I cannot answer your questions. They arrived at an old winery of sorts, where Adder finally allowed himself the mental space to doubt Talid's intentions. He certainly wasn't sure how to feel when the moneylender unbolted a conspicuously clean grill and signaled him to pass first. We cannot risk leaving her exposed to the elements. This is the best I can offer. Her? Adder turned his head to the hands he'd automatically kept locked against his torso since he came to. They felt heavy and cold. The realization of what it was that he was guarding so fiercely made his stomach churn right up to his throat. Don't let a single speck fall. Adder turned his head between the pile of ash and Talid, who was already making his way into the grill. 
any child could have told you what to do with the ashes of the departed. Throw them in the air, sink them in the sea, let the current take them away, so that the Hatsa may carry their strength to the new, ba new body. Holding on to them was wrong, but then again, nobody wanted to be right. Splash, splash, their hooves left short-lived prints in the dew covering the gravel below them. In other circumstances, Adder would have pondered whether Tailed lacked a sense of smell. It was the only logical reason he could find as to why the loner seemed so willing to spend his days crawling around dark passages and sewers. As it stood, however, Adder could only keep his eye focused on his palms and the glow emanating from them. It's not true, Fire. It shouldn't pose any risk of combustion. Talid wasn't talking to him, not really. He mumbled secret whispers to himself as they traversed the overwhelming darkness, guided only by the flickering light that Seb's remains offered. It gave neither of them any consolation. She's strong enough. She'll make it, she will. Okay. So, what? Are they going to find her a new body? Are they going to use some magic to resurrect her? Hmm. This episode has already kind of been pretty long. I was hoping I could resolve both Adder's situation, which, I mean, has kind of been resolved. Adder has um, come back to life. So yeah, I was hoping I could get both Adder's situation and, and Sepp's situation resolved in this episode. But, um... Seeing as, um, as this episode has already gone on pretty long and, uh, and I think it'll probably be a while yet before they can accomplish whatever they want to accomplish, um, to bring Sepp back. Um, I think we're going to continue from here in the next episode. So, um... It'll be interesting to find out how they are going to go about, um, well, bringing Seth back. I think that's what they are about to do and, um, and what happens next. But for now, thank you so much for watching and spending a little of your time with me here today. It was lovely to have you. Please remember to be kind to yourself, have a lovely rest of your day, and I will see you again next time. <laughs>